All right, welcome to another episode of Let To Be Talk. I want to give a, a couple tour dates before we get into it right here. This weekend, I will be at the La Jolla Comedy Store headlining Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the following weekend, I'm headlining in St. Louis at the Flyover Comedy Festival. My guest today is returning to the show, a rare uh, two-time guest. I don't usually do that. Uh, once in a while, though, and this is a good friend of mine, Mr. Nick Simmons. How are you, buddy? Hey, man, how are you? Thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. I didn't know you never do return guests. Now I feel very special. Well, if it's somebody like Josh Homme or something, or it, uh, usually when I have a guest on and we're just covering kind of uh, their life or body of work, I usually feel like, well, we kind of covered it. <laughs> yeah, you covered it. I, yeah, I get it. And I don't ever really have people on just as promo junkets because you know years down the road it, it seems kind of dated but you have an ep you wanted to uh, talk about and then i listened yeah. to it and i i go shit this is good gotta oh, have them on like it. i'm glad you like it it's not uh, obviously the usual straight ahead rock stuff but i appreciate you doing that i mean you've been so um before i ever met I, you know i've met a lot of uh if you meet one kind of stand up that you start meeting the whole kind of community. And so I've started meeting a bunch, but you were like the first guy I ever met in like the store kind of extended family, like the comedy store. And you're always so like welcoming and awesome. Just like immediately you were like, yeah, come here, everybody, come on in and whatever. And uh, much to the, much to the chagrin of YMH fans and now pals with a lot of these guys. Cause of, cause of you basically. Well, I'm a, a firm believer you know, when you have a famous dad or mom, people immediately want to shit on people or whatever. Jacob Dillon being one of my best friends, you know, of all time, I always felt like that's an unfair uh, label if the person is doing their own gig and going for their own thing. You know what I'm saying? So immediately when we were talking, I was like, oh, this guy's cool as shit, you know? Well, I don't know. They should be the, the nepos should be judged by the same metric everybody else is. So if, it, if they act good and they have, they they put out something good, then so be it. But I also uh, I don't usually defend them very much. I know a lot of shitty ones that are in my position that are kind of lame. So you know, I think it's sometimes that um, whole nepo baby uh, uh, hate is pretty justified. I mean, there's fucking there's so many of them now. Like they're just every there's so many of us. I should say. <laughs> out there right now all trying to jockey for attention uh, and it's like there's almost as many of them as there are just other artists and so it's like all right i get it i get the resentment it makes perfect sense to me i get annoyed sometimes when i'm like you didn't earn this slot on this show and i'm just like get out of here with you <laughs> hey man so, some of them know, are yeah. in this day and age a lot of people that don't have famous pre pre uh, parents didn't earn shit and, That's you fair, know, honestly. Yeah, they're just hot or something. <laughs> I've seen it all the time. You know, I've done almost six thousand shows, and then you see somebody get the keys to the city that's done thirty and shows. Like, and that guy, like, they had some video blow up on TikTok, and you're like, zero earning. And usually, well, it'll, it'll be a crowd work video, right? Mostly, it'll yeah. Be mo uh, where, they, where they film the audience and ninety nine point nine percent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've heard a few stand-ups I respect complain about like, oh, you have cameras on the audience now? So you're encouraging heckling, basically. <laughs> you know, I I was talking to somebody about it last night, a long car ride to Bakersfield. I was going out there to headline. And uh, when I started, if you did some hacky crowd work, meaning where are you from? What do you do for a living? Uh, you yeah. Are you single? You know, yeah. that stuff. Uh, a major headliner would pull you aside and go, Hey man, don't be doing that bullshit. You know? So I just, I never fucked with it. You know? Now, if you need to engage somebody in the audience organically, because something is happening, that is awesome. And cool to see, you know, recently I put up a clip. Some guy was fucking watching the show with his eyes closed. And I asked him if he was legitimately blind. And he goes, no, my eyes are just closed. And I'm like, well, technically, you're not seen. So that is a, a form of blindness, you know, but that's totally organic. Yeah, because you're like, what the hell's going on down there? I mean, Geraldo did that in one of his specials. Somebody who fell asleep in the front. You remember Greg Geraldo? I mean, oh, yeah, of course. Forever. Um, somebody fell asleep in the front row of his big special 
And I think he left it in to the whole, he left it into the actual Comedy Central airing of it. And he was like, he he did a whole 15 minute side bit on like, why are you sleeping? You look like you smoke weed. I have a, I have an idea of why you might be tired. And he just went into this whole riff on this guy. Like, it does take the wind out of my sails a little bit. That there's a guy asleep in the front row of my, it's like, it's not like we're on the subway in New York. Like, we're just fucking. Yeah. That's like, all organic. Theater. Yeah. Cause he's like reacting to a real thing in the room that's right. Taken. Right. You know, well, I've also, also like, a bunch of uh, uh, exceptions too, though. Cause like, I've seen people do the, the initial, uh, you know, hack premise, but then I've seen them deliver really good. Like Jessica Curson is amazing at it. Like she's fucking, I've seen her do it at the the cellar. And she, she goes, I mean, cause she's such a physical kind of Jim Carrey-esque, like face making comic. I mean, she makes people, you know, really react in like a almost a fight or flight kind of way. And so yeah, I guess she's I guess no rule. A good joke's a good joke, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, that's different. You know, she's like, uh, there's a handful of people. Todd Berry, fucking guy's a genius. You he know was doing I mean? that Crowdwork show before anybody, right? Didn't he release a Crowdwork special way before it kind of yeah. became a thing? Yeah, the guy's the guy is the real deal. Which, by the way, I want to give a shout out to Jessica Curson is headlining the Will Turn here uh, pretty soon. So get your tickets. She's fantastic. She really is uh, great. Yeah, you, you have you been going to the comedy store lately? I haven't seen you. So much. I went. I, we went to see. Um, Cal, who did we see at the comedy store? We went. We saw Santino and and Bobby Lee the other night. They did like a. Um, oh yeah. It Bad was, it was Josh had a Myers show. It was a Shimmy Shimmy Ya, I think. Right. Which, oh, great. It was amazing. It was, it was fucking awesome. Um, yeah. I uh, I don't know. I also like again because of you and and uh josh potter and a couple other guys i've been meeting all these people like i met bert and tom and christina recently and uh i went on ymh with my old man and their fans fucking hated me yeah <laughs> their fans fucking hated me they thought i uh interrupted him too much which is fair i was a little nervous but yeah dude you should see the comments on that it's pretty it's a pretty good Friars Club roast that I didn't volunteer for. That uh, they got me good. You should you should check out that post, man. No, man. I mean, you know, the internet. Everybody's got some kind of. Oh, they fucking uh, spit roasted me, man. They... <laughs> hey, how you doing, man? So you got this uh, EP, Sim Farah. Is that how you say it? Yeah, it's a band. So it's a band we've been releasing music with without telling anybody for like five years. Um, right. Because of the whole, you know, I just didn't want to deal with it um not like i'm some big deal but it was even there's just this if you release music uh after you've been on a tv show or something you know there's certain oh he's this kind of guy and the music is nothing like i think anybody would expect from me it's a little more indie you know pretentious hipster shit so i think uh i just wanted to not engage and just see if it had any legs on its own and i think we were we were pretty uh happy with how it went um, so now we're just seeing how far it can go, I guess. Now, let me ask you something about, um, the, is it two people or cause I yeah, was looking at the, yeah. it's you and who me and my, uh, my long time, my, my friend, Vinny Farah, who we've been jamming in clubs in Hollywood together for fun for like, I don't know, 10 years, like just doing covers and stuff. We finally actually recorded something. So during the pandemic. Oh, this was done during the pandemic. Yeah, we released the first couple singles. Uh, we got signed in 2019, and then the pandemic hit immediately. But we released the singles, I think, in early 2020, um, and been releasing ever since. And uh, first of all, I want to tell everybody it's an EP. It came out on the 25th. Yeah, the and, new one. Yeah, and it's six songs. Um, I was looking at it right here. Avert your gaze. Now that one you wrote the lyrics. And I think I wrote, I wrote the lyrics to all of them. We we do half and half mostly on production and songwriting, but he usually likes me to write the lyrics. He thinks that that's just how it has its own identity. I guess he he likes the way I do wordplay, but everything else is pretty much 50-50, straight down the line. And is it recorded like uh, just all on the computer? Because it's definitely got this um, kind of real lo-fi, mellow, mazzy star. Um no. Some of the stuff I've been listening to lately, King Hannah, which is unbelievable. Another oh, band. Oh, you got to check them out. And then another band, uh, Spotlights. 
uh, which is amazing. You're gonna you're gonna want to hear them. You got to give me your playlist. I, I need new uh, I need new algorithm stuff to refresh my playlist because I feel like I'm recycling the same old stuff now. Oh yeah, um, there's a lot of great new music out there. That is, I'm a big fan of this type of music. It's kind of atmospheric. It's mellow. There's some Nick Cave kind of. Oh, such a huge compliment. Well, yeah. you know, it's it's got that kind of or any kind of slow nine inch nails, not the industrial, but just the single keys. It's, it sounds fucking great, man. You're blowing me up. Thank you, man. Those are great. Those are really nice comparisons. I don't, I don't even know if I would say any of that, but um, no, to answer your question, I think uh, we try to go down the middle too on the organic versus computer thing, because I think it, it gets kind of stale when everyone's using the same, you know, hundred plugins and stuff. So I think, um avert your gaze was done a lot on uh, like the skeleton of it like the percussion was on the computer but I, but my partner owns a lot of analog moog synthesizers and stuff so as much as possible he tries to actually play them on uh you know 70s analog gear if he can and then there's another song on that track called nobody's that's entirely real instruments there's no there's no computerized anything on it um so again it, and then there's a track called beg that's almost entirely digital um and like kind of uh again more like that it, trent was trent gets a credit for a lot of stuff but he was so ahead of the game when it came to, i mean do you remember in the 90s when he was like weird for using computerized percussion like people were like you're in a rock band like why are you doing that and now he's laughing all the way to the bank i mean he's like he just saw the writing on the wall or something but uh yeah we tried to go right down the middle of like there's a there's a song again that's violins guitar bass uh, uh, piano and then there's a song that's just like you can't even tell what it's made of it's entirely digital so I, I can't really commit and that's, yeah. that's what it is. I mean you know Gary Newman's one of my all time favorites and uh, his last few records are just mind boggling and and of course you know early craft work is just oh, yeah. like top top five for me you know so I've always been a fan of kind of, you know, moog and and weird sounds and weird is the way to go. I feel like there's a way to get cheesy, right? With yeah. stuff, I think the '80s like jumped the shark in a lot of ways, and some of that stuff where it became kind of this hacky, this very specific synth sound that everybody kind of did, and it, dun, 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 you know, like right. it's, like Bouncy. the first one, first one's awesome, then and then everyone in, it does it at the same time, and you're kind of like, okay, whatever, but. I like what again Trent does and Tom York does, where they, they keep it very surreal, creepy, ghostly, and stuff. So we're definitely aiming at that lane, I guess. And also, I think you're probably a Beck fan, right? I mean, huge. Dude, huge. There's just one album of his that it's like he the, changes. No, everybody everybody loves. I mean, that's like the one he uh, I love got it. The most press for, and then like the morning phase he won the Grammy for. But there was this weird album in between that like nobody. Seem to talk about called Modern Guilt. Do you because oh, yeah, absolutely one of my like top ten albums because it's got this right down the middle organic garage band half, and then behind it there's just this like flavor of weird synthy percussion stuff. Like there's one song that's in like it's piano, and then there's like triple time weird overly distorted drums behind it, and it's called uh, Reptilia, I think. It's right. just like it's so Beck because he's just like not respecting the rules of genre at all, just like ignoring what classification this album's gonna be in and just going, I'm gonna do whatever I want. But it's got this great like stripped down quality, and then he throws in weird Beckness kind of like right underneath it. And I was like, that if I had to pick an album where I was like, I want to aim at the balance between digital and and totally natural, it's that album. I mean, I think that's one of my biggest uh I was like, I love the way he, it was like this nice sweet spot where like his other albums leaned heavily into one, you know, point of view. I mean, right. remember Midnight, Midnight Vultures was like of funk. Course. And then a lot of his stuff was like a lot of scratching records. Up, This was like, he stripped it away just enough, but not as much as Sea Change and not as crazy as Midnight Vulture. He kind of like hit this middle ground. I don't know. Someone's got to check out that album because I feel like it's underrated. I, you know, I'm blown away by the stuff these guys get big in their bands and then they go do a side thing. Yeah. And it blows my mind even more. Tom York with the smile. 
And then uh, great. So unbelievable. Great. And then Julian with the voids, you know, voids. great. You're fucking, you're nailing my playlist right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Uh, you know, also this stuff really kind of out of, you know, when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of the swans and, uh, and, and oh, you got to check that out. You know, I'm making, a list. I'm making a list. I'll send it over to you. And then, yeah. you know, that typo negative, you know, low vocal. Now, are you the singer on all the tracks? Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Me. I, it's anything's background sometimes, but mostly it's me. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's really cool. And it is interesting. I think like years ago, you were kind of doing a little bit of Marilyn Manson kind of vibe. And this kind of seems to have uh, blossomed into this, uh, you know. Yeah. I, uh, I think I was in a lot of rock bands, you know, like I think. And so Evan Stanley, my, my brother from my other dad, basically like my, he's basically my cousin. So just Paul's basically my uncle, but he's, he's doing a straight ahead rock band. And he kind of took the exact opposite path that I did where he just like, right away came out and he goes, I'm Evan Stanley. Here's my rock band. And it's like, it, that makes perfect sense for him because it is the, it is the adjacent genre to what people who like his father would like. So he kind of goes, here it is. And just kind of leans into it. And I kind of go that if I was doing a straight ahead rock band, I would have done the same thing. It would have been the smart thing to do because you know that the fans of that are likely to like this kind of thing. But my thing is not anything like the old man. And, uh, the old man, meaning my dad, not not Paul. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, all right, is it, would it even be helpful to lean in? I didn't think it would be even, I, don't, I didn't even know if the people who were paying attention to me because of him would even like this kind of thing. So I was like, all right, well, let's just see if we can like get it out there in some other way and, and get it out quietly. And then uh, a song or two got synced to a bunch of TV shows without them knowing it was me and without us kind of, cashing in the nepo chip and that felt really good uh, for obvious like ego reasons i was like okay so we might have something here and it it got it had legs on its own but uh you know we got a, a small but sort of very inquisitive number of people on youtube kind of just asking like who is this what is this we love it and it's kind of like i don't think a lot of those people were kind of rock and roll fans i think they were more like you said like in the the Becks and the craft works of the world and, and sort of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, alternative, like whatever you call that. Um, so I was so, I was pretty happy we did it that way because I think now that it has an identity of its own, even though small, we can talk to the, talk to the kiss fans about it and see if they like it too. But I just think, uh, do you remember when Chris Cornell, who's like my hero, of course. Uh, if there's any singer that maybe want to be a better singer, it's, He's like the one rock singer that actually like tries to be a classically trained singer. And he put out that album with like Timbaland, which was called it. Dream. I thought it was great. And I think uh, Timbaland, I think, said something about it. He was like, it got panned, I think, by a lot of rock fans because it was just not what they wanted from Chris. They wanted what Chris usually does. And he goes, if that album had come out under anyone else's name, it would have been universally praised because it was a great neo soul album but because it was pop coming out of chris's mouth people were like whatever yeah. so on a much bigger scale it's kind of what i wanted to avoid because people were like oh he's the rock guy he's from the rock family with the rock that i had never talked about anything else so i don't know that's why we were glad to do it this way well if you uh if you're talking to me who's 58 I'm constantly looking for new music, but most people are, are tumbleweeds and they like one type of thing. And a perfect example would be kiss the elder, which I fucking love. I know the band doesn't really care for it much, but I think it was uh, all these bands that I love that take a, a serious chance yeah. in completely sounding different. Uh, Josh Homme, Queens of the stone age, when he did that, uh, the, the last record, you know, uh, two records ago, and, uh, you know, totally went for like a dance thing. I, I love that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm liking the way the young, there's one kind of praise I can give to like the generation after me, the, the really young kids is that I don't know that they care about genre anymore. Like I think no. st streaming has created this just mishmash, this patchwork of things that they get to hear that I think the record store culture and the tower records culture that I came from 
where like if you were a rock kid you better not be caught listening to pop and vice versa if you're like a bubblegum pop person like who's acdc you kind of don't they didn't talk to each other they were like clicks and i don't know that i see that now like my i have young cousins and like they they listen to whatever like they just kind of go whatever hits you know i mean yeah. i i catch them just as easily listening to billy eilish as they do to like mozart or billy holiday or you know whatever the, the shuffle on their phone uh you know on their playlists on spotify and stuff is kind of wacky and i i think that's a good thing i mean i think it's more interesting that way anyway yeah there's a young band out of brooklyn right now called geese and you it's, you have you, you got, i don't know you gotta check this band out man they're young young people and you can't you can't describe them and they they record they make their own movies they do their own albums uh they do these really cool underground concerts and you know an apartment or whatever and oh. and they are just, that's it like one song is kind of this and then another song is this and and i look at that uh that's how i kind of look at comedy now it, you know uh i might have a one liner joke and then i'll have a story uh i'm telling and then i'll have uh you know some riffing and then I'll, it, it's just there's good, no good. one thing. Yeah, it's good. the point I guess is just whatever it is, do it well, right? And then yeah, do it well. I mean, then Beck is the perfect example of this. He was the guy, right? The cross genre guy, where every album was different. He refused to commit to a sound, and somehow, and he still found his people. And I think uh, where before he was this weird anomaly, like oh, he's the weird guy who does weird stuff. Who knows what he's up to? Whatever. And Bjork and artists like that were kind of very singular. I think we're all allowed to do that now. And it's great. I mean, I think they they paved the way for the, us, giving us permission, uh, all these young garage bands out there, to just not pick a lane and just go, I'm just going to make whatever I'm feeling right now and just yep. bygones be bygones, come what may. And hopefully you're, you know, you're, usually it's the voice, right? The singer's voice is what ties it all in together. Beck especially, it's like, you know, it's a Beck, Beck song because you know what his voice sounds like, but everything else, those could be different artists. I mean, compare midnight vultures to sea change that is a radically different album by every metric of tempo and instrument choice and lyrical everything is totally different and yet somehow it's still it's still beck and i don't know i i guess i'm i think people like us where we just we can't get enough music like we're not satisfied just listening to our old favorites over and over again i love artists like that i need constantly more and i i think uh I want to try to be an artist like that if I can just try to like not go, Oh, that doesn't really sound like us. So I guess we'll save that for something else. No, just do it. Why not? Just do yeah. just make, make something weird. Who knows what could happen? Do you ever hear that side project that the green day guys did? No. What was it called? It did. I fucking can't remember. It's worth a Google. It's um, they did like a doo-wop band with like wow. I think all the green day guys. And they were like, well, this doesn't sound like green day, but we want to write this. So, they had like this secret side project where they did like almost Motowny kind of like doo wop music, and it was really good. And people were like, "Is that Billy Joel from Billy Joel Armstrong from Green Day?" And he's singing like in a totally different style. There's no like none of that punk uh, word pronunciation kind of thing. Yeah, it's super weird. You gotta you gotta Google this. I wish I could remember what it's called, but I think Paul showed me that actually. Paul is very he's a real audiophile like you. Like he knows a lot. You had him on, right? Oh, God, yeah. Episode 500. How was it? I'll tell you the craziest Paul Stanley story. Uh, well, first of all, I think the top five episodes, uh, your dad would be in there. Just because oh. I've never really met a man like him where he's actually a massive star and either... You know, uh, people ah kiss or whatever. But, you know, I've said it over and over. The amount of people, uh, Cedric Bixler from Mars Volta said, kiss is the gateway drug into rock and roll. And the amount of people that either say Zeppelin or kiss on this podcast that got them into music is is massive. You know, it's like half and half depends on the age. So to have like Gene and Paul on. It's just mind boggling as a, a, a guy who loved him growing up. And that's what got me into music. 
But your dad, I mean, he drove himself over. I live in an apartment in, in Studio City. He pulls up. I see him. He's all, I'm here. There's no handlers, you know. He sits down. He's cracking some jokes, you know. And then, bam, okay. we're on for two hours, and he just killed it. And and Paul was unbelievable because he didn't know me at all and invited me to his house. And about two hours in, he goes, oh, I got to pick up my kids at school. Will you lock up? He oh. guy didn't. guy doesn't even know me. I mean, I'm, uh, oh, yeah, I'm just putting putting my gear away and he left and I locked up and, and went home. Well, that's nice. I, I, I didn't know that story. Yeah. But well, yeah. You... also thanks uh, to you for bringing uh, me backstage the night before COVID, you know, uh, at the, oh. at the, what was it? The Staples center. It was yeah, great. Be, it, Staples or forum. I can't remember. They did some Staples. Staples. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, you brought us backstage, me and my buddy Greg. Man, you've done the same for me. I mean, you've done, yeah. you've done the equivalent for me. I mean, my pops and I are both crazy comedy fans. So yeah. he said the funniest thing. I never forgot it. You go, Dad, it's Dean. Remember, we saw him at the comedy store last week. And he goes, and he was not funny. <laughs> I love him. And he What's... got me in a headlock. I got a photo. I'm in a headlock. He's in his kiss gear still all bloodied up. He's, you know what's funny is like I think uh, I think he tells a lot of dad jokes. Like I, I don't know that he his material is particularly great a lot of the time, but right. I think he, a lot of he shares a lot of experiences with certain kinds of comics who have trouble relating to non comics. Right. Like you'll there's a level of like East Coast irony and kind of like ball breaking that he thinks is totally normal. And if he meets someone it. from California that like doesn't do that he will make them very uncomfortable. Like he, he will go like, Oh, you'd be popular in jail is one of his favorite things to say. And people yeah. will be like, what the fuck is that about? And then of course, if you're in East coast, you're like, ah, whatever. Like you get it. But half the time, maybe more than half the time his like mom and my mom's Malibu friends do not understand <laughs> his level of ball breaking. And he, yeah. has, he gets himself into trouble all the time. Cause he's like, he was rude. And I goes, he was trying to, he was trying to hang out with you. Like he was trying to connect right. with you. I love him. Old Brooklyn guys do it. Like they just, they break your balls a little bit and that's how you know they like you. So yeah. you don't get that. And like the comics are the same. Ball breaking is the love language, right? So if you don't know that, you know, these like very prissy California types will be like, oh, I never like. Fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have a hard time explaining that to people about him. You said something amazing to me was you were like, congratulations you actually got the real Gene Simmons, which is really hard to do on the, True. You know. actually you got him to put his stupid character down, which is, I think he, I think he's more interesting without it. Frankly, I think he's a cooler guy without it, but. Oh my God. It, I mean, it's so epic. You know, I, I, I don't think he gets enough credit for what an incredible bass player this guy is, man. His bass playing is fucking incredible. I didn't know that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a good enough musician to detect that, but I think, uh, when I heard, uh, I think we took Jimmy Page to a show and got, he, he's apparently very supportive, which is funny because when you said everybody's gateway is Kiss or Zeppelin, I would say that Paul and Dad's gateway was Zeppelin. I mean, they were their fans of Zeppelin. So, and you can tell in some of those songs, it's pretty clear they wear their influences on their sleeves. For Dad, it's Beatles and Zeppelin, basically. Right. Um, but, the, you know, Page comes to the show sometimes and he leaned over to my mom and he was like, you know, he's very good on the bass. And I'm kind of like, well, if Paige says so, all right, like, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll believe him, I guess. hundred percent true. Now let's get into, uh, are you going to play live? How do you play live? It's two guys. Do you get, uh, we a hire guys. We, we've got a kind of an extended family of guys. So my, my partner runs a touring and management company called the beehive. Um, and that's, he didn't when we first met. We were just jamming. You know, we were just two guys jamming in clubs. But he has since. Uh, it's funny because I'm the you know you call me a, a nepo or whatever, but he's a real self made man. Like he created this company that is now working for some of the biggest, you know, pop and alternative stars in the world. I mean, he's he manages Halsey's tours and these sort of big pop people. And so I'm lucky enough that now that he's my you know, he's been my bandmate. Now that his company has taken off we get access to all those resources. So our, we did one show 
um, again, anonymously at the lodge room in uh, really? Highland Park. Yeah, I love that place. We did like this thing. We did. We took a page out of the comedians' books. We took phones in bags. Uh, we like hired that company to like put everyone's phone in a sealed bag, and so they couldn't film the thing. And we filmed it. So we have that footage, and we we disguised ourselves by like he has all these lights that he has access to because of his job. So we have these like audio reactive lighting that was behind us and put us in silhouette the whole time. So we've got this concert where like you can't see our faces basically, and we just didn't say anything. We walked out, we played the show, and we left. And uh, you know, just to test test the concept, I guess. Um, it's kind of like Kiss. Can't see the faces. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, we're like we're so we're I'm the opposite. With it. Yeah. No, I know, but like yeah. it's funny because we we actually wanted to um, engage with that as the opposite. Like, so Paul and Dad kind of lean into personality and uh, talk between songs and kind of really, and we kind of lean away from personality. Like we don't want our faces to be the point. Uh, we, we use artwork and all of our album covers and we use like our music videos. We're not in them. Uh, we have like these various directors who have artistic points of view and we have, like five or six music videos and the show too. Like we're in shadow. You can't see us because of the shadow and stuff. So we're trying to like uh, just make it, this kind of weird experiential thing and less about look at me, look at me kind of stuff. But um, we, anyway, so we collect, collected phones and bags and we put ourselves in shadow. We've only done one show to date. It's just that show, but it went really well. And then we were like, well, I don't know how to promote this now because I can't say what a great show on my socials. <laughs> so yeah. we just kind of like it happened and it went. And I think in the new year, we're going to, um, we're going to do another one. And then this one, obviously we can talk about because we're, sort of out of the closet or whatever so yeah. uh, we're going to try to do the same kind of thing just we're going to be able to talk about it this time um and when we, for sure all right you you asked uh we we hire we have these guys we don't hire guys but we have our friends who work for his company who are like musicians musicians and they come on stage with us so we have a real drummer and a real uh bassist and Vinny plays either bass or guitar and synth and i sometimes play keys and sing so we have four guys and you know, four separate instrument stations. So it, it is, we try to do as much live as we possibly can, even though a lot of the stuff is uh, triggered or, or digital or whatever. So yeah, that's how we do it. It's an interesting uh, singing tech, te <clears throat> excuse me, technique because it's very low and sedated. So you have to probably have in-ear monitors for sure, it, right? Yeah, yeah we yeah. use Jerry Harvey's. Um, but I think uh, it's funny. A lot of the songs that are on recording are very like falsetto-y and whispery. I think live, it doesn't translate necessarily that well. I think I found that out during rehearsals. So I do, I'll sing one of them like an octave up or, or just push it. So in live, it'll have a little more energy, honestly, than, than the recordings do. Um, and then there's a song called Mob that has like a big yelly chorus. So that, that translates really well to live. But yeah, it's been kind of challenging, honestly, translating weird moody music i'm actually trying to take a i mean billy eilish has this style of singing i know this is like not the artist to bring up at a rock podcast but I, I say this all the time that would have been an alternative artist back in the day you know what i mean like have you heard some of I her albums her. like i love her they're flirting with manson and like yeah. industrial rock and it's like that's mainstream pop now which is kind of great i i never would have seen that on the mainstream pop charts in like 2001 i feel like that would never have people would have wouldn't have considered that pop so i'm glad that there's an artist like that and she sings really uh oh someone's at my door uh cal can you get the door sorry um she <laughs> sings in like a whispery falsetto and i'm like how does she do that live so i'm trying to research like how she's heard in the mix it just might be just a really good mixer i don't know or like a high gain mic with compression on it or something i don't know how she does it so well because she seems to sing just like she does on the record live she goes like she sings like way down here right i just I'm saw trying, i'm trying I, to figure it out i don't know yet i just saw david gilmore and i was talking about it on my podcast last week the concert sound is so fucking good these days it is it is beyond and there's dudes out there that know how to mix this type of thing and yeah. David Gilmour, it he went no effects on the voice. Yeah, it was crazy. The, it was, was like crazy. way way up front, and it was like you know it was like 
wish you were here. Hey, you could like, hear the little imperfections and everything. It was great. Oh, it was, it was I, like, I was at the show. I was at show one at the Yeah, bowl. I was too. Wasn't that crazy? That yeah, vocal we tone. Nosebleed. We were in the nosebleed seats. I just did it the last minute, but my girlfriend's family was in town. It was like, it was really beautiful. I mean, it was like, I had seen Roger Waters before and he leans really heavily into like the visual components and stuff and like the, the crazy lights. And Gilmore was kind of refreshingly stripped down. It was kind of yeah. like, there was some of the the videos behind him, but mostly it was like him alone with a guitar and singing. And it was very like, I don't know. It really showed his chops, I guess. And his daughter killed. She could be yeah, like, great. she could another, use... another Nepo. Here, here she is. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll tell you what too. though, unbelievable. When they did that, that, um, you know, the four part harmony. Yeah. Of, oh my God. God, around the piano, that was insane. Her harp, uh, she did a song on her own with the harp. Oh, yeah, that's was, great. I, mean, I, got, I don't mind uh, if someone has a leg up, if they deliver at the end of the day. It doesn't bother me. I, know, I, it doesn't... I understand it's annoying that people get legs up, but um, the least they can do is deliver, right? If you, get, if you yeah. win the lottery, the least you can do is work hard enough to earn it after the fact. So, Yeah, I mean... It, it, that show, but the, the live sound and the vocal tone was like nothing I'd heard in a long time. I yeah. was like, it was like the vocal was floating right in the middle in your face with no yeah. effects. Yeah. Everyone uses a lot of verb now. I mean, I do it. And, yeah. and uh, he was, and you would think verb in Floyd would be a no brainer. It'd be, you think it'd be very yeah. verby. And a lot of times he was just dry and kind of, and I like that he didn't tune. I mean, there's, I think even the, um, even some of the old rock guys are using live tuning now. And I think he just, it, it didn't sound like he did. It sounded like he was leaving the imperfections in there and it kind of made it even more special that he left the little cracks and the notes, yeah. the goat notes and stuff. I like that stuff. I firmly believe, and I talked about it over six months ago, I believe we're maybe a summer away from the AI vocal is going to be coming and this is how it's going to happen. The singer is going to be out and let's say it's guns and roses. They'll just type in appetite vocal tone. He'll be singing. Now I'm not saying he's doing this, but I'm saying the older bands, it's definitely going to happen. Yeah. They'll be singing. They'll be like, all right, welcome to the show tonight. You know, and they'll be like, yeah, to get me. But when it'll he polish sings, it up, right? It'll yeah. trigger the AI vocal and it'll be the exact tone like those guitar tones right now that are all uh, sampled guitar tones. So, you know, people are using those those rigs. There's no yeah. amps on stage anymore, you know? Yeah. So there's that's a, coming there's, for vocal. There's, there's no uh, way. There's those guitar pedal plugins now that are sounding closer and closer to real tube amps and stuff. And uh, there's like these, you can have like a whole digital you know, guitar pedal library there and you don't even need to have the physical pedals. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to tell the difference and more and more. Um, I, you know, I, I'm too, I'm split down the middle, right? Like I'm an old head in so many ways. So to me, I'm like, whenever I see Jack white, just like hammering a nail into wood and just creating an old, like just being yeah. real MacGyver about it and using a piece of wood and an old Dobro and stuff. I'm always like, fuck. Yeah. And then I see people who just embrace it like York and James Blake and some of these guys. And I'm like, Oh, I like that too. So I don't really know how to feel. And I think uh, the rock head side of me understands the rage, right. Of the old heads of being like in my day, it was real, you know, kind of thing. I, I think they're right. And also, and also there's other stuff out there and I don't really know how to feel about it, but I guess it'd be silly not to use every tool you have at your disposal because yeah. We rem I mean, remember, Bob Dylan got booed for going electric, right? Yeah. So, Well, my that's... point is, I really blame uh, mostly the audience because in this day and a uh, age of not being able to make any money on records, you mm -hmm. have to go out and tour and tour and tour and tour to make money. Um, and so you got to stay on the road and then your voice is going to get shot. And then here comes the internet warriors. I went last night. And he didn't sound like the record. He sounded like shit. And now all of a sudden bad reviews are getting out there because somebody had a bad night. They had a cold or they flew. 
And then, you know, then people are like, I'm not going to that. I heard it was, uh, and then it becomes, you lack a draw all of a sudden. It's a, like it's, a restaurant with bad Yelp reviews. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it is. And it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's evil, man. It's evil. Like singing. I sang for 25 years. It is the hardest fucking thing to do on the planet. Cause it's your body every night, you know? I guess I'll find out. I, I haven't, uh, I used to sing weekly, but singing nightly is still, I got to get my endurance up because I'm, I'm sure that's coming. I hope we hope we get to do that. Um, but I mean, uh, your, your dad sounded amazing on the last tour. Amazing. Smart though, because he always wrote and co-wrote it right in his comfortable range. He never went for like Paul, you know, really has to do warm because he always wrote at the top of his range. He was trying right. to push it and really go for it. And that's so hard after 30 years because it's like you have to hit the highest note you can possibly hit when you were 25. Yeah. And then like you're going for years and years and years. And dad was like, that's Paul's thing. Paul, Paul's the, you know, the, the, the range guy. He's the front man guy. Dad was like, I'll write down here. Like, I'll write all my melodies will be right down here. And there'll be the occasional scream where he can shows what he can do. But mostly he's here. So it paid dividends later because he was like, oh, I'm just singing right in my comfy spot right here. Totally. And, big deal and i uh i i have also not done that i, I have yeah. a couple of songs i mean i'll be lucky enough if i get old enough and still playing that i'll be having a hard time with my old melodies but i uh i definitely learned my lesson when i did a, a couple live tapings because i was like ah, my goodness, this is not as easy as i <laughs> like when you're in the studio you get to do takes and comp and kind of like let me try that again <laughs> in Imagine live Brian Johnson. You fucked up. Yeah. yeah dude he Just, comes in, he's well, like, you do, okay. you do the Bon Scott thing. I mean, you do the, yeah, but, I can't imagine touring with that, but that's in my range. So that's I can, crazy I, to me. I can do it at 58 years old, but imagine Brian, you come in, you're doing ah! back to black and you're like, this ain't going to sell, you know, it, it, you know, well, maybe we'll go out, we'll do one run. So he sings stuff like have a drink on me and hell's bells that yeah. are, I can't do Brian at ah! all. Like way up there. <laughs> yeah, it's not in my wheelhouse. I can do Aussie and I can do uh Bond all night long. But man, Brian, and then here he is, like seventy three or four, and he's out there last summer, he's cursing himself. Like, why the fuck did I make myself scream that note that everybody wants to hear now? He's like, wait, yeah. <laughs> he's like, God damn it! I wish I would have recorded that differently because now I have to do it twenty times a month. Imagine if he sang the whole record like "Let Me Put My Love Into You," you know, like his uh, you know, "Let Me Put My Love Into You, Babe." Like the, it, that's yeah, in his range. There. Easy peasy, no big deal. Yeah, yeah you know, <laughs> it's it's Perfect. it's tough. Who did the artwork on the EP? It's fantastic. Uh, we've had a few different artists. The the, the paintings, the one that are, are white, is just a, a a painter I know named Jessica Gabrielle. She has an Instagram, Jessica Gabrielle Art. She's just a cool painter that I. I knew vaguely from social circles and, and uh, she's just cool. And I was like, Hey, would you ever sell me some of that for album art? It just looks really nice together. And she did this series of this, you know, ghostly uh, shadowy figure embracing another figure. And I was like, can I buy like four or five of those? And she said, sure. And that was that. I mean, it, I've kind of done that with all the artwork we've, we've done. Um, I, a lot of the first EPs artwork is from their music, their respective music videos. So we used to make videos for every song. Uh, we were just like, I don't know, I guess this has to be the thing because we're not showing our faces. So we would have a music video made before the song came out and we'd be like, oh, let's take the best screen cap from that and slap the logo on it and that'll be the the artwork. But uh, this time we uh, just found a painter and we're like, it'd be nice if it was all the same style. And I think the next album or EP will be the same thing. We're going to try to make the singles all the same style as the, this is like an OCD thing to make them all uniform. Um, and then every piece of artwork has the, little runic sigil that we use as the symbol in the center to kind of tie it all together. Um, but yeah, I just find, I mean, honestly, Instagram, like there's a lot of painters and, and artists on Instagram that are really weird and cool and doing cool things. I bought, uh, and I just reach out and be like, Hey, do you ever do album art? I'll, I'll, you know, let me know how much it would cost to license your piece. And I found this guy, this random guy named Ian Hodgson in, uh, in the UK. And he just paints these really cool, like silhouette creepy photos and I, I was like how can i buy these for album and he says sure and then he just sends me he sends me the real ones i have them upstairs um 
and it's not like they're not famous painters or anything. They're just like you yeah. your algorithm shows you something cool and you go, you just reach out and go like, hey, would you ever want to do that? And they go, sure. And they send you high res files and there you go. It's kind of nice to, and I've never met this guy. So that, that's probably our next artwork is probably from this random painter that the algorithm showed me. And there you go. So that's yeah. right. That's what I love about Instagram, man. I find so much great stuff out there. Some dude it's, making it's, denim. It's and creepy and evil, but it also can be can be cool. I mean, oh it's, yeah, it's absolutely. Cool, right? Depends how you use it. Now, what is the name about? Tell tell me about that. The name of the group. The name is because we couldn't fucking find a band name that wasn't taken, and so we just took the first half of my last name and his last name and misspelled them and stuck them together. So, my last name is Simmons. I spelled it with a Y, like symphony. S Y M, and then his last name is Pharaoh with two R's. We spelled it with one R, like the word feral. And we go, oh, if we stick that together, it sounds like Simphera, like symphony, uh, feral symphony, or something. And I go, surely that's a made-up word that no one's thought of, you know, like Bonnie Vare or something, where it's like this mispronunciation of a thing that just sounds kind of cool. And even that, I like. There's some random lady who has that name on socials, and she's not even an, she's not an artist. She's just like a a lady named Mary or something, who has the handle. And we're like, what the who? What does that even mean to her? Like it's it was impossible. I went through like compendiums of ancient Greek deities and like obscure literature characters, and I was like trying to find like a cool word. Like, and every time there's like six bands on Spotify that has the name, like. Uh, I was looking up like obscure death deities in like Mesopotamia. And I was like, all right, what about this one? It's like a very minor character in like the, the, the Iliad. And I looked up six bands have that name. And I'm just like, I was pulling my hair out for like a month. I'm like, how do people name their bands anymore? That's like, it takes two seconds to make a band named something. And there's like every word I looked up obscure words, just like I would go through dictionaries and just go, uh, you know, mesothelioma, onomatopoeia, everyone is taken. Like, it's all taken. And then, so we were like, all right, we have to make up our own word, I guess. That's the only way. And still, still, there was like a lady with that as her handle. I'm like, is that her nickname from high school? Why? Yeah. Who knows? So, what, it, it was like, we had to settle on the one that at least wasn't taken by an artist. Um, yeah. So, you guys are going to, uh, you're going to do a gig, what, in January, February or something? When, Probably in January. We're still. We're, we just. Um, we just got the venue uh, to agree to, that we want to do it. We got our first choice, and we're picking a date now. But it, most likely in January. Yeah. Can absolutely. you say what the venue is? I don't know. They haven't said like definitely yes on this date yet. So I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to go up until it's like a, a done deal. Right. I will. I'll tell you if they tell me today. But um, they said they want to do it. They're just picking a day that they don't have another gig. But uh, what what venues uh, do you go to? Like I went to the lodge to see Jack White last week and just fucking loved it. It felt so old school San Francisco to me, you know, that venue is I mean, that's a reason we picked that as our first and only show is it's a great it's a it's a moody, cool space. And that neighborhood is great. I mean, like the Highland Park Bowl and love it. You've been a gold line. It's that bar between Highland Park Bowl and the lodge room. It's just a random bar, but they only play vinyl on a real vinyl, vinyl player. So, like the DJ who's spinning, really spins like Marvin Gaye records and like hand, like the old days. He like hand beat matches them into the next record, right. and like they won't play anything unless they have a physical vinyl of it. They refuse to do aux cables. They refuse to do, and I'm like, that's the hipster shit I like, man. I love, yeah. <laughs> I love that stuff. Well, I love hipsters. People knock it. It's, I think hipsters usually means passion is really yeah, what usually I mean. Like I give a shit enough to be pretentious about something. And it's like, they can be obnoxious, but so, I don't know. I like a lot of stuff they tend to like. So, so be it. Yeah. There's hipsters. And then there's Walmart. You pick one. You, yeah, you, know? Like, uh, you know, dad's happy with Walmart, but. Uh, <laughs> Does he I shop drop- at Walmart? No, I mean he he's a, he still fancies himself at his core, like a blue collar guy. So I think he, yeah. He's suspicious of pretentious hipster shit. I think he finds it to be obnoxious. Yeah. He didn't grow up like that, you know. He was a uh, he grew up in Harlem, so yeah. Doesn't he? He's like when when people are like, "Oh, this shirt costs a thousand dollars." He's like, "Why?" Like I don't. Yeah, you can get that at Best Buy, like or whatever. You can get the Best Buy. You can get that at uh, Ross for the yeah. same thing. And they're like, "It's the way it's made." And he goes, "Shut the fuck!" Like, he doesn't understand. He wears the same free hat for like a decade. Oh yeah, and he's been wearing our merch. 
I told him, obviously, please don't tell anybody I'm in a band. I tried to like keep it on the down low, but he's been wearing a hat with our symbol on it for like four years. So it's like the, it's the most he could do without actually saying because he can't help himself. And that hat has been on a ride. Yeah. I never he like he has a picture in it like for his restaurant where he's like biting a burger his like rock and brews restaurant and he's wearing yeah. our logo. I'm like that is not the right context <laughs> for our little hipster band and then he's got a picture with like flavor flav and he's yeah. like wearing our little hipster band logo and I'm always like I don't know if I I don't know if that's the right look <laughs> he he's he's amazing I always crack up on him because you just kind of like you, you know self-made you know he's just loaded but, but he's, he's also not, like an old dad like he's right. always he's always been kind of a corny dad like yeah even, he's uh, not pulling up in a ferrari you know no, what I mean? he, no he is like he's like no this truck is bigger if you get into an accident it'll you know save you know, like that's the way he thinks about everything he doesn't think about it. he has no sort of style consciousness or you know right this is this is a uh, chic like he would never fucking say that <laughs> Yeah, like I see Paul at Air One, and he looks fantastic. He just comes rolling in, you know. Yeah, Paul likes Saint Laurent, and Paul's yeah. like a, a sort of a stylish gentleman. And Dad's like, "I got this shirt for free ten years ago, and it doesn't have any holes in it." Yeah, he's, he's like one of those guys. How's your sister? What's she up to? My sister's uh, arguably one of the maybe the most successful member of the family besides the old man. She's uh, She's like an in-demand songwriter now. Like she's, uh, she's nominated for a Juno Award, and she's writing for K-pop groups now, and she's destroying the landscape. She's uh, she's a force of nature. I mean, in the in the pop world, she is a known person now. Like she is a, uh, a she could sell her catalog. She's got a proper body of work now, and it's I'm especially proud of her because again, I think um, people would assume she had a leg up. I think in the pop world, it was kind of the opposite, where I think people wrote her off as a novelty when she got into like you, you, I don't know how much people know about the pop writing world, but you write in these group sessions with other writers and you're, you're pitching to an artist that may not even be there half the time. And like, they're not even in the room. You're writing for Rihanna, you're writing for whoever. And uh, she gets in these rooms because she, she clawed her way into these rooms and they assume that she got into these rooms because, you know, someone called in a favor or whatever. And so then she has to prove herself again, like in the room, she has to prove that she has songwriting chops and inevitably she does. And she gets these comments all the time where she's like, you know, I kind of wrote you off, but it turns out you deliver. <laughs> it turns out you're good at this. And she's like, yep, that's yeah. what I always hear. She always hears that word of like, oh, I was surprised you were actually good at this. <laughs> and she's incredibly good at it. She's really is good she at it. Is she writing the melodies, lyrics, or does she play an instrument? plays enough piano that just let me she, she and i play like songwriter piano like we know enough to write cool. songs we're not shredders we can't like yeah. you know play crazy solos but we Carol know king songs yeah pop songwriting level um and so she she writes as much as they let her but she's mostly yeah melody chord change and and in the and, and lyric and uh she's had a lot of success she's she's broken a few artists and had some radio play and a lot of the artists actually use her voice on their on that recording so she's gotten some features out of it and uh yeah i'm her biggest cheerleader man she's 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 earned every stripe of that well i'll tell you what your dad is crazy proud of you guys whenever i tell you he's like, well you know he you know he goes into stuff you guys are doing and and he just loves it which is super yeah, cool. i love that he sends my unmixed demos to people without my permission sometimes it's really great I love <laughs> that i've never given him those well, it was great to talk to you, and, and I was—I uh, really liked the EP. Actually, um, it was perfect too for Sunday morning. This morning, I, I went over. I got a uh, an, an ice matcha to start my day. Healthy, California, healthy drink, man. You know, I got to get—I got to keep my health on. And then I put it on in the living room, and I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And I listened to it about five times. And oh, Mob, nice. Mob was killer. It's the last song on the EP. And I was like, God damn, this song Mob is great, you know? Uh, but the whole thing is really, really good. And you could hear it definitely in like a Lynch film also. You know? Oh, that's, dude, you don't know how much that means to me. That's, yeah, but that's, that's the... true. You can put, it's kind of, it's kind of low key and dark. And um, it's just got a, a great vibe. And, um, 
I'm gonna take that. That's gonna. I'm gonna ride that Lynch compliment maybe for the for the rest of the month. That's really uh, he's, sweet. He's my all time favorite man. It's it's unreal. Uh, I did bring up the Elder earlier. Did what do you think? Did you you listen to the Elder? I think World Without Heroes is a great song. You know, the World Without Heroes was in that show. Uh, a recent show had it in their credits. It was uh, Billions, I think, used oh, wow. World Without Heroes in one of their episodes, and it, he was like, "Oh, our song got sent." And he, he he likes it, and I like it. I think it's more it's that same Cornell thing we were talking about, right? Where right. like you have this established sound and brand, and you take a real chance departing from it. And sometimes some artists it's embraced, and some artists it's really rejected. And I think. Uh, think about radiohead i mean they started as this all oh, yeah. rock band basically yeah. and listen to their latest album and it bears almost no resemblance None. to their early stuff and that was embraced and because it was the right crowd to to shift right and i think kiss fans want kiss they want right. to hear the specific thing i also. love elder i love i, I, like I, I even I like uh, carnival of souls you ever hear that album that the grungy one they did in the 90s absolutely yeah the great singer i i like that one also, I love the look of the look they had on the Elder Man. Oh, oh, the Elder, yeah, that's right, the right. Look great, man! It was just stripped down, but it was still like outfits, you know. <laughs> oh, thanks for getting me into the uh, the Gene Museum. I'm going back to the um, uh, to the Rio to do the Comedy Cellar for New Year's Eve. So oh, great. I, I want to go back in there again and, and just, trip just tell me. Let me know. I'll, I'll reach yeah. out. To the guy. Well, let's get some lunch sometime. I'm ready. We need to hang out more often, man. I really, I really mean that. Not in like a, a stupid LA flaky way, but like, yeah. let's do it. I've got a sandwich shop I just discovered that I want to keep from blowing up that I want to take you to. Cause oh yeah, okay, like, yeah, and then, those Italian sandwiches, man, they're great. And over in my neighborhood is the my favorite restaurant of all of LA for lunch is spectacular all time. Oh um, yeah, 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 dude, that place no is, that yeah. So come over. Uh, bring your lady, whatever, and we'll get some lunch sure. this week. And I uh, like the, uh, the the YMH fans will point out every time I interrupted you, probably if they hear this. So, oh, you know, mind. it's a fuck people, you know. <laughs> I talk when I'm nervous. <laughs> well, here's the thing: people, for the most part, are shitty, and <laughs> it, it's really insane. Like they just don't understand the amount of work it takes to get to somewhere to even get on uh, Tom and Christina's podcast. And then I mean, you, get, you get on there and you, and you want to talk and you know, like when my first hundred episodes 13 years ago, I still get emails, man, this host sucks. He fucking, he's just talking about himself the whole time. And you're learning how to be a, a podcaster and, 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 you have to perform a little bit as a podcaster. You yeah. have to, you know, make it, you know, interesting. And also you're talking back and forth. So when you say something, it triggers something to me and I go, Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just nature. Mm -hmm. And if you've only done five podcasts or 50 in your life, you're not good yet. You're just mm -hmm. fucking promoting and getting the word out of what you do. Hey, people come in, ah, this fucking guy, fucking. I remember one guy went, this guy's forehead's huge. It's like, yeah, so what? <laughs> it's better than a big belly like you got, dude. You know, whatever. <laughs> like, to, the, to their to their credit, I mean, I was I was jittery and obnoxious in that show. They're not wrong. I was, right. but there's a reason. It's because I'm I was I was told by my sister and mother, make sure your dad doesn't get canceled. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. trying to head him off at the pass if I ever thought he was about to flirt with an area where, and yeah. Tom wants him to go there. Tom is like, tell me the groupie stories. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to like yeah. head him off at the pass there and like try to save him from himself. Right. And then I'm like, God, he won't stop interrupting him. I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking running. On purpose. <laughs> yeah. He, he'll talk himself into it. He already did that. Like they, someone got mad at him for dancing. Uh, he went on Dancing with the Stars. Oh yeah, that was crazy. People he, are crazy. He, like he's being creepy. He's like, you mean he? And I and my sister watched it, and she's the most. She's the wokest of all of us. She's yeah. very sensitive and young and very. She's in tune with the ways of the world. Right. And she watched, and she's like, no, he was just saying like, you look beautiful, and you did a great job. Right. And we're yeah. like, why are you saying he looks beautiful? And he's like, he's like, I, I don't know. That's how I talk to people who look great when they look great yeah. I yeah 
<laughs> also, if he said they look bad, it would be, you know, and it'd be moment. like, oh, they was, you know, they were shaming. Ugly yeah. shaman. I'll, I'll I'll cop to it when I think he's being a he's being an eighties yeah. guy. He's an eighties guy. Like he's yeah, a seventy guy. He he has been alive for seven decades. Of course, he's not going to be perfectly yeah. in tune with the cultural mores of our time. But uh, I didn't actually find him to be anything on that show. I thought they were freaking out over nothing. I just think they're not used to him in the, in that context. I don't think people who watch Dancing with the Stars consume his shit so i think they're like right. who's this old guy being old but somehow thinking he's still cool it's like well he's he's been used to that for like yeah for decades. yeah put the the people that complain put your grandpa on let's see what yeah. he says how's yeah. thanksgiving dinner gonna, at your place how does it's that be come? worse <laughs> you know what i think about politics you go oh fuck here we go yeah, like, fucking <laughs> nuts He's pretty good for a 75 year old guy when you compare him to other 75 year old guys. Oh, fuck yeah. He's yeah. Pretty lucid when you think about those comparisons. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was great talking to you, dude. And oh, you. Uh, now you got an Instagram um, for the band? Yeah, sure. Mine is fine. Uh, uh, Nick T. Simmons is me. And then the band is Simfera Music. But I'm, I, I link to it on mine. You just go to mine and then you'll, you'll click I'll it. I'll tell everybody how you spell it. It's S Y M. F E R A and then so Sim Fera Music uh Instagram and go listen to the EP. It's out right now. It came out on the 25th and it's on all the streaming platforms or YouTube and it's fantastic. So thanks I'll, for doing I'll do it. How about a, an exclusive for you? Because I I've, so we're we're releasing a cover of a very well known rock song uh next week. Oh so you're the first to hear it. It's uh yeah, maybe I should just tell you that you can yeah. have the uh, we're covered because I'm such a massive Cornell fan and I got to know him a little bit near the end and he meant a lot to me. We're covering Black Hole Sun. So wow, in a very sort of strange uh, style, but I'm going to start uh, teasing that out fairly soon. But uh, and then where, the where what day is that coming out? I believe it's the 15th, November 15th. Oh, excellent. OK, so, so I'm going to do my I did my very best again. I think his lyric in that song is true. No one sings like him before. No. Nobody. I don't think anybody, and I'm not claiming to, but it was very important to me to try to do it in the original key and to do my very best to try to try to do it without much help. I, I didn't, uh, you know, we didn't uh, artificially put my notes up there, whatever we tried to like, I tried to nail it. So yeah. I think it was always going to fail at that, but I tried to fail as well as I could. So I hope Well, you I saw you sing Woman with... Um... Wolf with mother. wolf mother and uh you were up in the key there so you know sounded well, great it's a, it's a tribute to chris because he was not only maybe the best singer in, in my generation but one of the best people i mean he was an unflinchingly kind nice just yeah. a, a magnanimous human being and it was like it was a loss to music and it was a loss to just mankind to lose that guy he was a special special guy so Dude, I, I think hands years. all over is one of the greatest vocal performances in 30 years. Like to look like he looks like Brad Pitt and he sings yeah. like a like a god and he's still kind and compassionate. Yeah. This guy was like, there's no one like he could have gotten away with being a total asshole if he wanted to be. And yeah. no one would you, you look like that and you have that talent and that prestige. He could have gotten away with murder and he chose instead to be this incredibly charitable and compassionate guy and like this family man he's just like i, I can't say enough good things about chris so and, and i always i always really force people to go back and listen to ultra mega okay and the flop ep and louder than love this is to me was one of the the greatest early early uh you know you got Jane's Addiction and then you got Ultra Mega OK. And these records were just like, what the fuck? This is our Sabbath and our Zeppelin for me yeah. when I was, you know, 20. He was my plant. Yeah, he's the plant of our generation in the 90s totally. to me. Because he was like, you couldn't believe the power of this guy. No. And you, he just does it all day long. Every song is yeah. this power. And then he goes soft and like Black Hole Sun and Fell on Black Days. And it's heartbreaking. And it's yeah. beautiful. And it's sort of like he can do everything. It's the most it's the most beautiful voice in rock and roll, man. It's, it's, and then his solo records even are like often oh. ignored. And Euphoria Morning is one of my favorite albums. And it's like this total departure. It's gorgeous. And it's just the power this guy could just generate from his face is yeah. crazy. It's, it's worth a revisit. So I'm going to try to 
do it justice. And I will fail because I don't think anybody can do what he can do, but I have to do it anyway because I love him too much. So sounds great. Looking forward to hearing that. And uh, everybody that's uh, around the 15th, you heard it here. Let there be talk and exclusive. Thanks for doing the show. And also go back and listen to our original conversation. I think it was like maybe six years ago or something. Yeah. Right and, before we started this band. <laughs> yeah. So go check that out. And uh, and also the Gene and the Paul interview. And uh, if you're a big kiss head, Bruce Kulik's been on. Oh, everybody, Bruce. Yeah, everybody's been on. So uh, check it out. And thank you for tuning in to another mm-hmm. episode of Let to Be Talked. Thank you, Nick, for doing the show. I'll see you this week. Later. Later, buddy.